being once an inmate myself is something that um, it's no words really to describe that experience, especially um, when you find Islam in that type of environment. A lot of people don't realize that many of the inmates or the Muslims inmates inside embraced Islam while they was there. So many, just like myself, had really no contact with Islam or Muslims before incarceration. So like myself, being originally from South Central Los Angeles, where on the t side of LA that I lived, on what we call the East Side, we really didn't have much presence of the Muslims. Whereas on the West Side, that's where you have a lot of the known messages that you hear about, like uh, Masjid Ibn uh, uh, Umar Ibn Al-Khattab, you know, big masjid there. You have several other masjids on that side of town. So for myself, coming in contact with Islam and the Muslims, and then finally uh, reaching free society, it's been like something that's undescribable because being in one world versus another world, you know, only knowing one way to live prior to incarceration, then getting out and you're in a totally different world. It's like, it's not like you're getting out after 20 something years and you're going back to your old family and uh, the same uh, situation that you was once in, but you're actually coming out as a Muslim and there's a totally different set of circumstances that you would face um, versus uh, before. So I just wanted to say that briefly about myself, um, that I'm here before you as um, an ex-gang member, ex-inmate, <laughs> the, whole, the whole line, you know? So uh, alhamdulillah that I'm, you know, Allah blessed me to be a Muslim today. So alhamdulillah. Um, I just want to take something from this story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. And one of the things about it is, I think about is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises people up as he raised up Yusuf alayhi salam, after being thrown in a well, after being thrown in a well and forgotten, and essentially purchased for a low price by people in the marketplace and sold. And during that time, uh, in that process of being just attempted to be a seduced by the women, um, the king's wife, all of these different things that followed. One of the things about the story, though, you know, just throwing into the well and being forgotten is something that I think about because I look at myself in that situation where I was on a bus being transported to prison. And I was just sharing this story recently with someone, and I didn't think about it until just the other day, that when I was being transported to prison, out of all the times that I had been in and out of the courts and things like that, um, they would take a certain route so that you're not near the neighborhoods, you know, and no possible break, breakouts and things like that. But this particular day, I told myself, I said, this will be the last time that I probably want to see my family again. I knew it. I, you know, I was sentenced to life. So I said, I'll never see my family again. But this particular day, for some reason, strange reason, the bus drove right down my block. And I, it's never happened. It was, for some reason, they was, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they saw about law, but they drove down my block and I was able to look down the street that I was raised on. And that's the last time I've seen that street in 23 years, 23 years. And um, I never knew what would happen. And, and I'm sure with Prophet Yusuf salam, when he was thrown into the well, he never knew where he would end up. Um, I never knew where I would end up. And one of the things I told myself, even though my lifestyle was definitely Jahaliyyah, uh, you know, my lifestyle was totally against Islam. I told myself that God, I said, God is not going to leave me in this place. I said that to myself. I said, for some strange reason, even though I know I was sentenced to life, I feel like at some point, uh, sometime that maybe I will be released. 
And as I went through my prison sentence and the Islam came into my life, I knew as soon as the moment that I knew that I was going to accept Islam, I said to myself that this is what I thought years ago, that Allah would not leave me in this place. So when we relate the story, people will plot against you, even your own kin. Your own kin would even plot against you. Your friends, the people that you thought would be your friends. And in the case of Yusuf, السلام, it was his own brothers that plotted against him to throw him away. And that's what happens to many of us because so many of us are embracing Islam inside the prison system. It's the fastest growing religion in prison. And it's many of the African Americans and Latino Americans are embracing Islam. And we're a people that don't know anything about Islam when we embrace it. So it's like we're in an isolated bubble just trying to figure out what's Islam. What's Islam? And when we write letters trying to get some type of response from the outside, usually it falls on deaf ears because there's a disconnect between ourselves and the people in the free world. So Yusuf only trusted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which for, for us, you, that's all you have is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's actually a strength. It actually raises us up. And in the population, the prison population, and amongst the guards, the prison guards, the employees, when they see that taking place, when they see an inmate becoming Muslim and they see his state being raised up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't understand it. Because now him coming through the regular child line and take a meal, he's saying, I don't want to eat this food because it's not halal. They don't understand what's, what's this transformation that's taking place. They really don't understand it. Then they see that we're not involved in any of the legal activity that's taking place in the prison. They see people being called away from gangs and, and gambling and all of the things that take place inside the prison. It's more of that inside than you see sometimes out here. So now they wonder, like, wait a minute. So what they want to do is remind us that we're still the lowest of the people. We found you in the well. How are you going to be walking around calling people to Islam, calling people to uprightness, telling people that they don't have to eat uh, pork and drink alcohol and do drugs? How are you going to be this type of you committed a crime? You're in prison. You think you special? How many times were we told that? Who you who you guys think you are? Y'all think y'all special? And this is the response. So our only response was we have to write to the people in the outside. We have to put in some type of uh, co complaint to the outside that we need help in here because they see us and they see this transformation and they go look at our file and they say, wait a minute, this person came to prison for this crime. How is he doing all these things now? So it just... It, it baffles the imagination. They don't understand how is Islam doing this to people? Because believe it or not, there are Christians there as well. There's Catholics, but they don't get the same response the way the Muslims do. Whenever something bad happens in the prison, who do they call on? They ask the Muslims to come negotiate and let's work this out. Let's try to see with the Muslim because they look at the Muslims of people of intellect in the prison. So they come seek out the Muslims, even the, inmate, the inmates amongst themselves, as well as the prison staff. They look out for the Muslims to actually uh, solve and answer their questions, just like the inmates in the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, where people, the inmates would come and seek out uh, an answer. They want him to interpret dreams. He was a light that was amongst that place that the people didn't have to guide them. And this is what's taking place inside the prison, but people don't know about it. So when the letters go out from the prison to the various masajid and there's never a response, the responses are usually coming from uh, strange type of ideas related to Islam. Because usually the people, the sectarianism in Islam, you know, you're always looking for followers. When you have a deviant view of the religion, those are the organizations that always respond. 
So oftentimes when you don't have organizations like the Table Foundation, a lot of Muslims inside end up having a, a false belief about Islam. They don't have a, a correct aqidah. Or, you know, they, they, write, they send in books to them for free and say, read this. And now, you know, they, they adopt Shia, uh, extreme Shia views and various other type of ideologies. Because they don't have the support of the various communities that's teaching them Islam. So here it is, we have Yusuf السلام, in prison and essentially forgotten by the people, but he's patient. He's patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many of us, you know, half of the people that we talk to and communicate with today, if they had known that we actually spent as much time as we did in, in prison, I've actually, the majority of my Islam has been in prison. I've only been out almost a year. I was a Muslim for 18 years in prison. So I spent 18 years practicing Islam in prison before ever seeing a masjid or a wudu station. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's indescribable. And I, I shared this with the brothers. I asked them, do they have the same uh, experience is myself for myself because we don't see beyond the walls ourselves. It gets so desperate at times that when we're inside the prison, you feel like you're never going to get out of the well, right? That you're inside this place. So you never look over the gates. There's these gates and barbed wire and walls that you never, your eyes never venture over those walls and that gate because you know that you'll never find yourself there. So all of us, when we inside the prison, we walk around and we see each other, but our vision doesn't go beyond those walls, right? So I've been telling people since I've been out, my vision is real bad, distance wise. It's like, I, I always get lost. I call it shake. I say I'm lost because I can't see the signs that saying, you know, exit 34 or 45. And I, this happens all the time. But it's because I realize that it's because we've only our, our mind has adjusted our eyes to only see so far. So I never look ahead. I never look beyond what's right in front of me. So by the time I reach the exit, it's like, OK. And this happened to us a lot. We always find ourselves on the highway saying I'm getting lost. So when people ask me. Do I want to, um, you know, exercise and they want to jog? And they say, let's go. Is they got a nice track at Castro Valley High School. Beautiful track, if anybody's been there before. But it's, I said, it's in a circle, though, right? And they said, yeah. I said, I mean, I said, that remind me of walking on a prison yard because they keep you walking in a circle because you can't go beyond the perimeter of the, of the, of the yard, the recreation yard. So... Ever since I've been free, I've I always jog just distance. I never jog in a circle. And it's, it's something that's subconscious. I don't think I consciously do it until I actually was told about, you know, the track. I just started finding myself do it. So you hear a lot of brothers and sisters or whoever, when they, when they get out, they always want to go distant, not in a circle. So, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing that um, when we look at the story of Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam, that we find our own story. We find our own story. There's so many different aspects where we find our own story. And just, I don't know how much time I have here, but just, um, I don't want to be too long-winded. Um, it, it's just something that I was thinking about. There's an ayat in the Quran in Surah Al Yusuf, uh, Ayat 53. Um, and it mentions, وَمَا عُبَارِعُ نَفْسِ إِنَّ نَفْسَ الْأَمْرَاتُ بِسُوعِ إِلَى مَرَاحِمَ رَبِّي إِنَّ رَبِّ غَفْرُ رَحِيم And in this ayat, it says, and I do not declare myself free, most surely man's self is wont to command him to evil, except such as my Lord has had mercy on. 
Surely my Lord is forgiven, merciful. One of the reasons I read this ayah is because the nafs, we know that the nafs can cause us to do terrible things. The nafs that's prone to evil, this nafs amara. And during the time when you're in a place like that, similar to Yusuf, where he was attempted by these women, he refused because of taqwa. And so many times, so many times, So many times um, we would tell brothers while we was there that if you don't keep the nafs in check, if you don't follow this deen as presented to us by the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you're going to be here for the rest of your life. We used to tell brothers that all the time. And we were convinced a long time ago that as long as we follow this religion, that we, as long as we follow this path of Islam, that eventually someday we will be free. And it was so obvious, it was so obvious that, you know, because again, the shayateen always want us to be in enmity with each other. The shayateen want us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's their job, to disobey Allah. And I'm truly convinced to this day that because I stayed taqwa Allah and remained on the path of Islam without deviating, without, you know, messing around, because believe me, they have a way of keeping you there. And, you know, there's been experiences that I've had I can share with you right here today. And uh, the Insur family, major support to me <laughs> while I was there. Uh, they was right along that ride with me in some of those situations. But as long as you hold to the path, as long as you don't leave anything for them to say, look, you're still doing this. Because once you say that you're a Muslim, they definitely go expect you to uphold that standard of being Muslim. So they waiting for somebody like us to, you know, get caught doing something illegal inside the prison or not truly following the deen. Right. And they would even ask us questions like uh, Muslims pray five times a day. Right. And we like, yeah. He said, why are some of your brothers here don't pray five times a day? I know they don't. I see you guys going over there, leaving the basketball games and go play uh, uh, pray Salah. But I don't I know it's more Muslims than that on this on this facility. Why all we see you guys praying, always going to the chapel, reading and they couldn't understand that. But the, every person that they said that to, all of the Muslims that they presented that with are on the street right now. MashaAllah. I can name them. They all out right now. Every last one of those brothers is, is free right now. And they were all serving life sentences. Which means that they could have spent the rest of their life there if they decided. So that's a proof that Islam rehabilitates. It's a proof that Islam raises people up. And as long as we follow it, whether we're in free society, whether we're in a place like that, whether we're in a well, as long as we have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he will change our circumstances. So I just wanted to, you know, it's, it's so much that can be said about this topic and it's not an easy one to talk about. Um, but hopefully that I've said something that would actually open your eyes to some things about this and how um, we can reach out to those brothers and sisters that are still there because there's some, uh, bro one brother in particular, I just wanna, I have to bring this brother, mention this brother, cause I just wanna, I don't wanna misquote something 
that I said or misrepresent something that I said about all of us being out. It's actually only one of us is left. It's only one brother that's left, a brother named Adib. And he actually came really, came really close to uh, being free right after myself. And uh, we really hope that with the programs that we have here, uh, Taba, he just needs help. And I feel like if he had an attorney or something like that, because he has a kind of uh, difficult, uh, complicated uh, case, that's the reason that he's still there. He's been in prison now 32 years. 32 years. He was a military man. He wasn't a criminal. He was not a criminal. He was in the military. He actually protected his wife from, because she, the, the child, they had a child together and, and the child died because of her abuse or negligence. I won't say abuse. I would say negligence. And he came from the military base home, seeing what was going on and didn't report it right away. And he's still in prison to this day for that. He didn't commit a crime whatsoever. And I know this for a fact. We studied his case and he's been in prison for 32 years, but all he needs is an attorney. And I think he'll be free right now. If he had an attorney, that brother would be out of prison right now. He's been in prison 32 years on the path. The brother's been practicing the dean. He's basically filled my shoes since I've been gone as far as teaching the Muslims right now. There's no reason why that brother should still be in prison. So inshallah, maybe we can do something for that brother's case. Inshallah. I'm going to end on that note, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah khair for having me and uh, the, the, the organization, the Table Foundation. Uh, and we appreciate you all's attention and attendance today, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Um, MashaAllah, although I've known Yusuf for, for 10 years now, I'm always finding out new things about his life. And that's the way all of our lives are, right? Ali radiallahu anhu, one time uh, speaking in rhetorically to a person, he said, you, oh man, you think you're a simple creature, but inside of you is the universe. Like each one of us is a universe. And there's so much about ourselves, you know, that we, we don't know. And there's so much we don't know about other people. So that's why it's good to, to, to get together in, in jama'ah, in congregation, to learn more about each other. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. He's made us, We made you tribes and nations. لتعرفوا. To, to, that you may know uh, that the most noble of you are the most God-fearing. And we can see that through stories in the uh, people coming to Islam from the prison because they came from the depths of, of society, uh, both in uh, socioeconomical-wise, from, from poverty, from, from states of uh, being criminals, many of them, and to the other end of the, or I won't say the other end of the spectrum, but to the middle path. So the, the talk is about Yusuf alayhi salam and how we relate it to our lives. And we have to remember that when we read the Quran, when we read any aspect of the Quran, each one of us have to relate it to our lives. We're not reading it as a history book. We're not reading it as a book that's related to somebody else only. It was given to the Prophet wasallam, but as a message to all of humanity. So we have to relate every single ayah, every single lesson, every single thing to ourselves. And Umar ibn al-Khattab used to remind people of this. He said even those ayahs that talk about Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl and the kuffar at Badr and the kuffar at, uh, at uh, Uhud and all of those other ayahs and Fir'aun and Haman and all of those other evil characters that are mentioned in the Quran. He said we, you relate that to yourselves. You relate that to yourselves and, and see what lessons you can draw for that. And stories are one of the greatest way to pass on a lesson. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or, uh, or one of the reasons why He uses them in the Qur'an. And you'll see, I've, from, from teaching whether it's adults or children, once you know, the, 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 the group or the, 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 the group of students get kind of dragged down, as soon as you say, let me tell you a story, everybody kind of perks up. 
and they listen to that. And even if you, somebody spoke for two or three hours, if you ask them what are the main points of what they talked about, they'll say, oh yeah, he told me this story about you know, when he was young. And, um, so it's very, it's very powerful. So we have to look at what the, the, um, we have to look at what, what lessons are being presented to us in that story. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins Surah Yusuf by saying, we give you the best of stories. So everybody has stories that they can tell, but Allah is saying, we give you the best of stories. And this is something we should remember for ourselves, and especially if we're parents. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, the famous, um, the famous scholar uh, of tasawwuf and of fiqh, and he, he joined between the two, and he used to be able to, uh, to audit both sides. He would audit the Sufis and tell them what they're doing wrong, and he would audit the fuqaha, which very few people in the history could do that. But he was one of those people that could do that. Imam al-Ghazali was also another person that could audit both sides, the fiqh, the fuqaha, and the, the people of Tasawwuf, the scholars of Tasawwuf. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, because he was an orphan, he said his grandmother raised him, and she did a number of things to, uh, uh, to raise him, and a lot of who he is is because of his grandmother. One of the things she would do is she would hide the food because they were poor. She would hide the food in their house. And then she would tell uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, she would say, let's go make dua for, for Allah to give us food. And so they would make dua. She said, okay, now let's look for the food. So they would look around for the food. And then he would finally said, our dua was answered. And so he said she was giving him early, early training. Um, I did that one time with my daughter. She, she, I was telling her not to roll down the window. And I put the, the window lock on. And then she said, I heard her under her breath, she's saying, Ya Allah, make the window go down. So I, I pushed the button, and then it went down. She said, well, my dua worked, my dua worked. <laughs> maybe, maybe that, I mean, uh, it, we know we have to teach them that dua does work. There are people that are going to facilitate that dua, but it works. You made the dua, I pushed the button, it worked. Allah maybe, you know, put it in my heart to open up the window. So... Another thing Sidi Ahmed Zarruq's grandmother would do is she wouldn't tell him fairy tales. He's, and you know, people put their kids to sleep with fairy tales, they make them up, they read them out of the books. She said, he said, she would never tell me those fairy tales. She would only tell me stories of the Sahaba and of the prophets and of the, of the awliya and of the friends of Allah. So that's how she reared him. So that's a reminder. When I read that, I, I said, okay, I got to start reading less fairy tales and tell those stories because the kid wants that, those amazing things that happen. But when you tell the stories of the prophets, there's plenty of mu'jizat, miracles that happen. So in the story of Yusuf السلام, is something that we can all relate to. Just like any aspect of the Qur'an we can relate to. One of the things that it's really good for, and the scholars mention that, because of the content of the story, is it's an antidepressant. And they actually mention that, that it's, they say if a person has huzun, if they feel depression, if they feel sadness, reads the story of Yusuf السلام. And why is that? Allahu A'lam of all of the reasons, but one of the reasons is, is that when we, when we have a, a disease of the heart, and sadness is a disease of the heart, and it could be at different levels, there's two kinds of, there's two kinds of um, cures for it. One is to actually do something, to actually do, and whatever the disease is, the scholars have laid out either do something or reflect on something. It's either an action or a reflection. And so, in, in, uh, for example, for depression, one of the, 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 um, the sunnah methods of like an action is to wear yellow clothing. And Ibn Abbas mentioned that. He said that it's, uh, 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 if you wear yellow, yellow clothing, it helps relieve, um, re relieve sadness. And he uses as a proof of this, the story of uh, in Musa alayhi salam, it was, what color was the cow? Hmm? Not the golden calf, the cow that they were supposed to slaughter. What's that? No. Yellow. It was yellow cut. Tasurru uh, it, it delights the people that look upon it. So he said, they, they're delighted. One of the things that they're delighted because of its yellow color. So he said, yellow col looking on yellow will remove sadness. So that's a, a amali, like a, an action. There's also reflections that we can do. So when we read Surah Yusuf, we're supposed to be reflecting on what's going on here. What are, what are these different uh, aspects? And I'm not going to go through the whole story because it's very long. Um, in fact, there's a joke that they said that um, they invited this, this teacher to, to dinner. And um, they, um, oh, there was two teachers. And one of them wanted to, to distract the other one so that he could eat more of the, of the dish. So he said, yeah, Sheikh, tell us the story of Surat Yusuf alayhi salam. 
because he's thinking, okay, now he's going to go through you know the longest story in the Quran, and and uh, and so he said there was a boy that got lost and they found him. Bismillah. <laughs> so we all know this. We're all familiar with the the, the extended version of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. But I wanted to pick out three points of where he was forgotten, and 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 talk a little bit more about that. We know the story of he saw the dream and his father told him to not tell the dream. And it's not mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the surah, but in the tafsir, it's mentioned what happened. He actually went and told his brother that, that dream. And they knew what the 11 stars and the, the sun and the moon, they knew that this was something special. That Allah had, subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen him for something special. So it, it, it increased their jealousy that they already had of him. And then they plotted to get rid of him. One of the older brothers, Yahuda, said, okay, we're going to do this, but we're not going to kill him. Just promise me that we will not kill Yusuf. So they said, okay, we'll promise. So then they went through that, that plot with their father. They said, take him out so that he can race with us. He took him out there. They took him out there. As they take him out, now imagine this. Imagine the people who you trust the most, your own family members, that you would never think that they could, that they could um, 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 abuse you. And think of, of his state when they start abusing him. Because before they threw him in the well, they started beating him. And some people say that he was 17 years old. Other scholars say, no, he was closer to like 9, 10, 11 years old. But in either case, he was still a young man. And these were his older brothers. We all know how much younger brothers, for people that have older brothers, um, or they've seen other people with older brothers, you know how much people look up to older brothers. Now here's Yusuf alayhi salam. He's, he's a young man. His brothers are all men. They're young, uh, they're, they're, they're young, strong men. He's looking up to them as his older brothers. He's looking up to them also because they have a connection. Their, pro their father is a prophet. Their grandfather is a prophet. Their great-grandfather is a prophet. It's Yaqub ibn Ishaq ibn Ibrahim alayhi salam. Their great-grandfather is Ibrahim alayhi salam. So they're from that same family. They're from that Ahl al-Bayt. They're from that family of a prophet. So he's sharing this connection with them, and then they start beating him. And he doesn't understand why this is going on. And as they're beating him, they start saying to him, they start insulting him. They say, now where are the 11 stars? Why don't you get the 11 stars now? And for anybody who's seen when oppressors start um, beating on people, they'll start ridiculing their faith. And they'll say, they'll say, where is your God now? Where is your God now? And they'll start ridiculing whatever they, where's your mom, where's your dad, or whatever that person holds dear to them, they'll start ridiculing it. So that's what they did. Now they're adding insult to the injury. And Yahuda calls out to them and he says, I, you, I took an oath with you that you wouldn't kill him. They said, okay, let's throw him down the well. And where was this well? They were in the Ard of Sham, the land of Sham, near Palestine. Some people, some of the Mufassirin said it's a, it's a well in Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem. Others said it's a, it's, a, it's a well on the other side of the river in Jordan. And some said it was no, it was a, uh, it was a, a well near where uh, Ishaq alayhi salam is buried. And that's in Hebron. So it's either, it's either in Palestine and Jordan. Somewhere, that's where they were. Because he was taken into the land of Egypt. They were in the Palestine, uh, Jordan area. So they throw him down the well. Now when he's down there at the bottom of the well, he's one of the only prophets that gets revelation before being 40 years old. The sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ gave to all of the prophets is that they got revelation when they were 40 lunar years of age. But Isa السلام, when did he get his first revelation? What's that? Right when he was born. Yahya السلام, also received it as a child, received revelation. Um, and, and, then, and, and Yusuf السلام, as well. He got his revelation as a young boy, 9, 10, 11, 12, something like that age, or 17. But as a young boy or a young teenager, he's at the bottom of the well. Now imagine how he feels. Put yourself in his shoes. That's what this story is for. Put yourself in the, in the shoes of Asya, the wife of Fir'aun. Put yourself in the shoes of Musa alayhi salam. Try to feel what they felt. And this is why the ulama say these stories of the prophets, they're given to us as what they call in Arabic, tasalli. It's to make, it's consolation. Because if we know that the prophets are the greatest of mankind, and they cannot, they're, they're better than the angels. There's nothing in creation better than the prophets. And yet they experience hardships in their lives. Some of them have experienced hardships more than what we could ever have. So when we're sitting there with bills piling up and income going down, 
When they're sitting, when we're sitting there with our child, having problems with our children, when we're sitting there with having problems with our uh, with our community, with our spouse, whatever it is, whatever problem that we're dealing with, just think about the prophets. They're better than us, and a lot of times they experience worse than us. How many of us have ever been thrown down a well, abandoned, kicked out of their house by their family? You don't have to raise your hand, but you raised your hand. <laughs> I don't think so. Be careful about saying that. <laughs> Um, but there are stories like that. My mother shared uh, a story with me about there's a group in, of prisoners in, um, in Georgia that started a meditation process. It was like a Buddhist, uh, what were they called? The, the Dharma Brothers. They did, a, they did a documentary called The Dharma Brothers. And, oh, sorry, it's Alabama. Um, and they're not all the same, by the way. It's the South, but each state has its own subculture. So... Um, my mom's from Mississippi, so we have a connection to the South. Um, so they're, they're, in the prison, they instituted a, a program for using meditation, Buddhist meditation practices, and it helped a lot of these guys. One of the guys that's in the documentary, I haven't had a chance to see it, see it, but he was, him and his sister were like eight and nine years old, right? Young kids. Their, mo their mother drove them out to an abandoned house in the middle of a the countryside in Alabama and just dropped them off. And she took off. Now imagine an eight and a nine-year-old kid, boy and a girl, and you know they can't, they don't, little kids don't understand a lot of things. If you, if you get angry at a little kid, they can't, they can't process that. They think if a parent yells at them, oh, my dad, you know, or my mom, you know, they don't love me at all. They can't understand, they can't distinguish between this one incident, this one incident that they're, they're reprimanding them for and like a complete rejection of them. So imagine the, those two kids being abandoned in the, on that, in that place. They were, that was their well for them. And then they came up and then they had, the brother went his path, I don't know where, where his sister went, but just imagine their life that they had to experience. So when we get down, when we feel down, think about Yusuf Ali Salam, read that story and reflect, how would he have felt at the bottom of the well, being left there, abandoned by his brothers, after being beaten and insulted. But now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him consolation gives him revelation in the well. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring us down to raise us up. The greatest honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to any prophet, you know, because he gave Musa alayhi the, salam the, 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 seven, the seven miracles. It wasn't just the staff and the, the, his hand of shining light. There were other miracles, the, the locusts and the blood and, and so forth. He gave them the miracles. He split the ocean. He brought the manna and the salwa to them. For Salih alayhi salam, he brought the camel out of the rock. He gave all of these honors. But what's the greatest honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given any prophet? What's that? Anybody? That's a question. Open, open form. Isra wal Mi'raj. It was Isra wal Mi'raj where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet وسلم, to the furthest point of creation where even at that point Jibreel السلام, said, and one of the poets said, Idhab Taha, Idhab Wahdaka ya Taha. Go by yourself, Taha. I can't, I can't go beyond this point at all. This is, this is something special for you. But what, what happened before Isra wal Mi'raj? Am al Huzun, the year of sadness. His wife Khadija passed away. His uncle Abu Talib passed away. And he was driven out of Ta'if with insults and rocks to where his feet were bleeding. That, had to, that was a process that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was bringing him closer to him because at that point, you know, we're talking about forgotten believers. When Yusuf salam was forgotten in the well, who forgot him? It was his brothers. When the Prophet ﷺ was, uh, felt uh, uh, rejected out of uh, in Ta'if. Who rejected him? It was the people. It wasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when we read in Surah Al-Duha, what does it say? مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not rejected you and He is not angry with you. This is what the people are doing to you. I'm not angry with you. I'm not rejecting you. I'm not forgetting you, Yusuf salam in the well. Because we'll never be forgotten by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll never be forgotten from Him. The creation is going to forget us. Your spouse may forget you. Your brothers may forget you. Your company may forget you. Your, co your, your, your community may forgive you. Everybody's going to forget you around or could forget you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forget you. He will never forget you. So that's what we have to remind ourselves when we feel forgotten. 
And everybody's going to go through this at some point in their lives. Even the, the people in their ivory towers with their yachts and their millions and their riches and all of that stuff, they're going to feel sadness and forgotten. But they have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not, is not forgetting us. So Yusuf alayhi salam gets taken up from the well, sold into slavery for a, a measly price. Darahima ma'duda, just a few, a few dirhams. Uh, a, 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 a small price and sold into the land of uh, a slavery in, in Egypt. Now imagine that too, your freedom, the greatest thing that you can have ripped away from you. And we don't have time to go into all of uh, the, the correlations between Surat Yusuf and the experience of, a, of, of the prisoners in the U.S., but the overwhelming majority of prisoners in the U.S. are of which race? African Americans. Is that because they're uh, uh, because they have a higher incidence of criminality? No, it's not. Statistics have shown that. For every 100 uh, convictions of crack cocaine, there's one conviction of cocaine. This is like, they're, they're arguing this as Senate committees, it's not just like conspiratory theories. Who's using cocaine? Who's using crack cocaine? So the, the laws are designed to have more people of minorities, especially African-American males, in prison than other, than, other, than other groups. And if you read, there's a lot of history that's been done that this influx of African-American males into, into prisons, when did it happen? When did it start? No. No, go back. Before Jim Crow. Right after slavery, right after slavery, there's, and there's, there's research done, you can go uh, like look and, and find, there's research done on this, it's right after slavery, and there's a lot of historians that have researched the numbers on this, and they're showing that, these, that, the, that the people that had cheap labor, slavery, because you still got to pay them, right? You're giving them food and clothing and shelter, whatever, rags or whatever, you, you still have to pay them, you're giving them uh, the leftovers, but you're still paying them. Now they've lost this great labor force that they had, what did they do? The prisons, the chain gangs, and they used to just bring him into prison and now it's still, same thing. It's a different system, but now cheap labor. And if you look at the 14th Amendment, slavery is outlawed in the U.S. except for as a punishment for a crime. You can still have slaves in the U.S. You still can. And the CDC has them and the Federal Bureau of Prison have them. And then they get them in, those, in the prison industries and they're paying them seven cents an hour, nine cents an hour, 10 cents an hour. They'll be lucky if they got 75 cents an hour. Making, making that money. It's just cheap labor for them. So Yusuf alayhi salam was sold into slavery. A lot of these people were sold into slavery. And then if they weren't sold into slavery, their communities were flooded with cheap alcohol and uh, cheap dr and drugs and all of these other things and weapons and so forth. And so now they're enslaved to a life of, of, of drugs or alcohol or gambling. Just look at, uh, <clears throat> you can't even find fresh vegetables. Could you find fresh vegetables in like South Central, Compton, those areas? Like nice vegetable stores? But there's plenty of liquor, right? Plenty of liquor. So that, and that's not done. You don't go up into Dublin, Blackhawk, and all that stuff and see liquor stores in every corner. So there's, there's city planning. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, permits that have to be taken. Whatever, there's a, there's a process that's, that's making that happen. So they're being sold into slavery, just like Yusuf alayhi salam was sold into slavery. Now, let's fast forward, because we can't go through all of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. But when he goes into prison, and one interesting thing to know about uh, him going to the prison is that a prophet's dua is answered all the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer the dua of anybody. And there's some ulama that say that you have to be in a righteous state and you have to be a good person to have your dua answered. And other ulama said, no, no, you don't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he said, I answer dua, I answer everybody's dua. What did the shaitan make a dua for? Give, make me, give me immortal life. Give me immortal life. What did he get? Immortal life. You made a dua. You asked for it. One thing that really struck me, I was reading about, uh, we were trying to look into some stuff to, say, to uh, process it to save some manuscripts from West Africa because it's one of the last strongholds of, of where a lot of manuscripts are and they're not preserved. And so I came across a website of the University of Michigan had donated, uh, or not donated, but given this 800 pounds of um, Titanic recovered material, whatever it was, and it's all waterlogged. So you can't open up those books. You have to go through a special chemical process. And one of the letters that was there was from a young man, like he was a young teenager, who, long story short, he was from um, 
South America boarding school in, in, in Europe, in Britain, and he was on a ship to go back to his, uh, or to go to his sister's wedding in New York City. You can imagine the affluence that he's coming from, right? His parents are in South America. He's at a boarding school, going to take a ship to his sister's wedding in, in New York. He misses, or he's not able to get on the ship that he was supposed to get onto because of a coal strike. So they put him onto the Titanic. Well, they, found, they recovered his suitcase, and in it is a letter, and he's writing this letter to his family. He says, he's writing about his disgust of being on the Titanic rather than the other ship that he was supposed to be on a couple days ago. And he said, I hate this ship. I wish it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. And subhanAllah rahim, I saw that letter in a museum in Michigan at the Ford Museum where they had the Titanic exhibit. They had that letter there. Allahu alam whether it was his dua, but he wished for it. And there's a saying, be careful of what you wish for because you just might get it. So if you make a dua, you're going to get it the way you ask for it. And that's why they say it's haram to ask for the haram because you just might get it. And, that, and so you don't want to even open up that door. Now, I'm saying that, you know, we have sometimes as, as regular human beings, nonprofits, we can have bad adab in something and do, and, and do a dua that's, that's not proper. The prophets cannot do anything haram. And I want to preface that because I'm, I'm about to say something about Yusuf alayhi salam. What was his dua when he was dealing with the, the tribulation, the fitna of society? What did he say? Hmm? What's that? He says, As-sijnu ahabu ilayya. I'd rather have prison. You asked for it. He could have asked for, Oh Allah, free me from this fitna. Allah would have given him that. But he asked, he said, put me in the prison. I'd rather be in prison than have to deal with this. He got it. That's just a reminder to us when you sit down there and you make dua, especially for parents against children, they said, be careful because parents for their children, their dua is always answered. So don't make a dua against your children. And one man came to a scholar and he was complaining about his son. He says, my son does this, my son does this, my son does this. The scholar looked at him and he said, did you make dua against your child? And the man thought, he said, yes, I did. He said, well, you're dealing with the situation. You caused it. You, you asked for a bad situation for him and now you got it. It doesn't make it right that he's mistreating you, but you're the one that started this. So we should be careful when we're making dua. Now Yusuf salam goes into prison. One of the first things that he does, you can imagine, and it's not even... No matter how hard the modern prisons are, like California prisons, federal prisons, it's not like the dungeons of yesterday. The dungeons of Fir'aun. The dungeons of Fir'aun were, were underground dungeons, no windows, no light, nothing. The, and there are some modern dungeons where they do that. There's a place in Morocco where the late king of Morocco, Hassan al-Thani, there was a rebellion and he took all the people involved in that military, attempted military coup, and he put them in a, in a prison in southern Morocco called Tazmarart. And I was reading about it in this guidebook of, of Morocco, and they said, and if you ever mention this name of this city to any Moroccan, they'll shudder. And so I tried. I said, let me try this. So I asked the Moroccan, I said, um, have you ever heard of a prison in southern Morocco? It's called Tazmarart. He's like, ooh. And uh, what happened at that prison is that he had these guys prison in 20, for 20 years in small um, cement boxes about the size of this thing. They couldn't even stand up. This is, and this is not like, the, the, some of those guys got out. And they said they, some of the way they dealt with the, with the, the go, you know, because you, you're going to go insane. If you, if you put somebody in that for a couple of hours, you're going to go crazy. We're all naturally claustrophobic at one level or another because it's fit, the fitrah is reminding us of the qabr, of the grave. So they said one of the ways that the, the men that actually survived that was through um, a spiritual brotherhood that they had created. So they had created, they had done their own, created their own form of tasawwuf to deal with the madness of being encaged in, um, in, in cement boxes. So, Fir'aun had underground dungeons. You can imagine what the, the kings over there, they didn't have, you know, the, some, of the, 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 some of the federal prisoners send, send emails to us. We answer questions of, of an email. These people are in dungeons. When Yusuf alayhi salam comes in, he's a, he brings up, he, he, he lifts up their life when they look, everybody looking at him. Just imagine looking at a prophet. Could you imagine just looking at a, the beautiful face of, a, of any prophet? Especially Yusuf alayhi salam who was given half of the beauty in, in the world. And the other half was given to, uh, to, to the rest of humanity. And somebody one time asked one of the scholars, he said, well, if Yusuf was given half, 
uh, where does the Prophet ﷺ come in? He said, when we're talking about half and half, half for Yusuf, half for everybody else, whose whole are we talking about? Who's the whole that we're talking about? We're talking about the Prophet ﷺ. So they're looking at him, he, he lifts them up. And when those two men that came in with the, that they had the dream, and they wanted to ask about the dream, they said, what did they say to Yusuf ﷺ? They went to him. Inna naraka. And you know, I know Wahib's got a. Did you memorize Wahib, Surah Yusuf? Where is Wahib? No, not yet. You did? Inna naraka. Pop quiz. <laughs> okay, he's nervous. I'm not going to put him on. Min al muhsinin. They came up to him and they said, We see you from the good people. We, we see you as a person of goodness. Tell us about this dream. So they tell him the two dreams, he gives him the explanation, he tells one of them, you're going to, you're going to be executed. And what happened was in that story, because the details aren't always mentioned in the, in the, in the surah. It's, left, it's kind of almost like an outline. And there's a hadith that fill in the blanks, and there's also tafsir. Some of the early sahaba were the Jewish, like Ka'b al-Ahbar, and he had access to Jewish scriptures. So he filled in some of the blanks of some of these stories, because people say, well, where do we get, like, where do we get some of this tafsir? He had access to some of the Jewish scriptures, and he, fill, and he used to teach a lot. And then also we have the, the Isra'iliyat, we have the Jewish scriptures. And so some of this is filled in by, by, by other scriptures. So what happened was those, there was a person, the, the baker was going to poison the king. When his plot was found out, he blamed it on the guy who pours the wine. And so uh, the, the, the king, he threw both of them in prison and was going to execute both of them. Then they had this dream. Then the guy said, I see myself carrying bread and the birds eating the bread from my head. And the other man said, I see myself pouring drink for the, for the king. And Yusuf gave them, the, gave them the tafsir of that. And when, they, uh, when, they, when the one man went out that was going back to the king, what did he say to him? Remind the king about me. Just remind him. Because the king locked him up for fear of a, of, a, of a scandal, right? That's why he, he didn't want the scandal, you know, we see it now in the news, right? All these big guys up at the top, the scandal breaks and that's it, they're wiped out. So he didn't want this scandal to break and wipe out his section of the, of the empire, of the, of the Egyptian empire. He wasn't the, the main guy, he was like a, he was a minister. And so he, um, he jailed Yusuf, but then he forgot him. And that's some, of the, that's some of the situations in there. Yusuf's talking about Adib, the system just forgets you. The system will forget those people in prison and now it just counts it off and it's just Adib, and I know him personally, Adib is just, he's just a piece of paper to the state of California, that's it. And maybe his file gets misplaced and oh, a couple years later, oh, we, we need to address this, right? Or maybe they're just like, oh, we can't deal with this section of the file, put it in storage, we'll deal with it in, in 2014 when we need a re-election or something. So they just forget them. There's also people, there's one person who um, he went recently to the Board of Parole hearings, and one of the things that they want to see when they, when they say, are you suitable for being released, they say, do you have remorse about your crime? Well, he was claiming innocence. So he said, you know what, uh, I'm innocent. So they said, you're denied, denied, denied. So he went back the next time, he said, yes, I feel very remorseful for the crime that I committed, this, that, and the other. They said, well, you know, here in the, the case, it actually says that you're innocent. So how are you saying that you're, you're remorseful for your crime? Like, we've... We don't have enough evidence to say that you're guilty. Why are you saying you're innocent now? And now you're denied on that you're, you're, you're trying to mess up the system. They're agreeing that he's innocent. It's just the system, the paperwork hasn't caught up with him to let him out. And now they're saying, well, you know, this doesn't add up. So the system can forget you. And that's what happened to Yusuf alayhi salam. The system forgot him. And so he was in there for nine years before these two men came in there. When the one man went back to the king, he said, remind the king about me. Well, when the king, when that man went out, what, what did the shaitan do to him? He made him forget. Made him forget Yusuf. Now here's the, here's the forgotten believer. But it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's forgetting him. It's uh, the, the, the people and the system. So three years go by. His, whole, his total uh, uh, sentence was 12 years. And then finally the break came with the dream being uh, the dream, uh, the king having the dream or the minister having, the king having the dream and nobody being able to interpret it. Yusuf Ali Salam gives, it, gives an interpretation and they say, let's free you. He said, yes, but before you free me, I want you to exonerate me. I don't want to come back into society and people say that I did ABC. You make sure it's publicly known that I'm cleared. 
And it was actually Zuleikha, the wife of the, the minister, she cleared, she said it was, I, I falsely charged him, I falsely accused him. So then Yusuf السلام, comes out, he's in charge of the storehouses of the earth, of, uh, of Misr, and then we know his family comes and, they, and they, uh, they come and they see him. And it's really, subhanAllah, subhanallah when you read the last part of that, that story where he does everything, and then, and then Yusuf, he asks his brothers, because now they, you know, he, he did the, the thing where he put the, cu- the, the king's cup in the, in, the, in the baggage. And the, why did Yusuf السلام, put the, baggage, the, the cup in the baggage? Because he knew their law. The law of, of, their, of them at that time, Bani Israel, was that a thief, if he's caught, he becomes the slave of the person he stole from. That, that was their sharia. So he knew that. So when he put it in there, he said, okay, you guys, you have a thief amongst you. And they said, no, no, no thief amongst you. He said, okay. If there is a thief amongst you, what are we going to do? Yusuf knows, but he's getting them to say it. He said, well, our law is that he becomes your slave. He said, okay, now search the baggage. Okay, Bin Yamin stays with me. Then he goes back to the next process, and then the brothers, the brothers come back, and then he asks them. And one of the Mufassireen say that Yusuf السلام, was still wearing his shirt. That, that, um, that he ha- because they remember when they threw him in the well, they took off his shirt to go put the sheep blood on it to take back to his father. But around his neck, he had an amulet. And in that amulet, he had a silk shirt. And this silk shirt was from Jannah. And Yaqub, his father, had tied it around Yusuf السلام. Where did he get this shirt? He got it from his father, Ishaq. Where did Ishaq get this shirt from? He got it from his father, Ibrahim السلام, who Jibreel السلام, gave it to him when, when Ibrahim was in the fire and all his clothes got burned. His skin didn't get burned, but his clothes got burned and he brought him this silk garment from Jannah. Ibrahim wore it, he gave it to Ishaq. Ishaq gave it to Yaqub. Yaqub tied it in an amulet around, about, around Yusuf. When he was in the well, he opened it up and that's what he wore. And that's what he continued to wear. So he was wearing that when he was speaking to his brothers. And so they looked at him, but something wasn't adding up. It was as if they recognized the shirt, but this can't be Yusuf. And then he said, what did you guys do with Yusuf? And they say, is that you, Yusuf? And now... They go back, he takes off that shirt, sends it to Yaqub السلام, and then Yaqub um, uh, comes into the land, they all come in, it was Yaqub, his wife, and his 11 sons, and they all bowed out of respect, and now the dream comes true. The sun and the moon, his parents, and the 11 stars, his brothers, bow down in respect to him. You know how long it took from the time he had that dream until it became true? 40 years. 40 years. And Yusuf السلام, he waited out that 40 years and he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never forget him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a promise to us as believers. He's going to fulfill his wa'ad. He's going to fulfill his process. All we have to do is wait. It might take a year, it might take two years, it might take 30 years, it might take 40 years. So uh, with that I want to end and mashallah it's a, it's a blessing to be able to speak about the prophets because they say when we speak about the prophets and the righteous people, Allah descends mercy on that gathering. I'll end before the, um, before the documentary just talking a little bit about what we do at the Taiba Foundation to remember the forgotten believers, a section of the forgotten believers. One interesting thing to me was that when we put this documentary out in Ramadan, there was another documentary going out called a Forgotten Believers as well. Did anybody see it? About the Muslims in Myanmar that are being uh, dislocated from their homeland and so forth. Read about them. And it was a reminder to me that even though our organization serves these brothers in prison, these brothers and sisters in prison, there's plenty of forgotten believers out there. And there's plenty of forgotten people. So what we have to do is go out and be the people that remember these people, the orphans, the poor, and, the, and so forth. What we do is when these prisoners need an outside uh, line to the community, we, we respond to their letters. And we receive hundreds of letters. And we also deal with the letters of some organizations uh, that don't have the capacity to have a prison outreach uh, program. And, um, and so they give us their letters. Zaytuna Institute or Zaytuna College is one of those uh, organizations. They, any letters that come to them from the prison, they give them to us and we have a collaboration with them and that we answer those, those letters. Some of those letters are just a simple question or, or, a, or a, um, a request for something a Qur'an, a prayer rug, uh, uh, prayer beads, questions about the deen, um, questions about last will and testament. Yesterday, we got a letter from a brother who was uh, inside prison, who became Muslim in prison, and he was diagnosed with kidney failure. And he wants to know, can you help me design, uh, write out my will? So we're helping him with that, and also trying to make his 
whatever life he has remained, um, and he's in a type of solitary confinement, so it means he's in a cell by himself for 23 and a half hours a day. Um, so we answer those letters. Some of those letters uh, turn into students. They, there's, we have an application process, they become students, and then we, we involve them in our distance learning program where we send them books and audio commentaries and answer, and answer their questions and go through a certification process to make sure that they've answered those letters. Some prisons we work directly with the chaplains that are there at the, at the prisons. Um, we also, in, in this whole process, we have a board of advisors comprised of uh, one who's a, a nonprofit a tax accountant, and he deals with a lot of the accounts for ICNA, MCA, a lot of the nonprofits here in the Bay Area. Um, and he's on our board of advisors. We also have a, a lawyer who's on our, a nonprofit lawyer who's on our board of advisors, so, and chaplains. And all of this is to make sure that we keep everything in line uh, because when we're working with the, in the prisons, it's a very sensitive situation, especially for the Muslims in the prisons. So we have to be, we're, we have to realize we're walking on thin ice with the law in that we're, we're doing everything by the books and staying well within the boundaries but we always have to have these board of advisors um, consulted on various issues that come up. Um, that's the majority of what we're working on right now is our religious education through the distance learning program. We also have uh, hopes in the future to be, to be able to service the, the prisoners at, at, at various levels. One is through uh, having a re-entry program. Right now we don't have a, an official, or I won't say it is official, but it's not, the majority of our focus is not on the re-entry, but we do help people as they're coming back into society in whatever capacity that we can, but the majority of our focus right now is on our distance education, but we're working for the, uh, towards the re-entry. We're also working with other organizations like one that was founded by Yusuf and Tahar called the Timeless organization um, that does that focuses on, on non-religious based uh, rehabilitation and mashallah they just got uh, 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 they're going to be called into the um, what is it called the board of parole hearings up in Sacramento so that's that's a big uh, a big so we're going to go in uh, to, to he's going to, to speak about those programs that he's doing and Leiba has been alongside helping out in whatever capacity that we can with that. Uh, we take uh, the, the, the resources that we need, the main resource is human resource. We need people to come in and be dedicated and help us. Various things in operations, volunteers, events like this, spreading the word, also going into the prisons and jails as visitors. Um, we need uh, monetary donations for operations. Uh, we also take zakat and we use zakat to pay for the religious educational materials of, of the prisoners. So if you donate zakat, it's transformed into books and CDs, Islamic books and CDs, and that goes into the pris uh, prison. Sometimes, actually in one case, excuse me, we used zakat money to pay for a lawyer, and that lawyer was essential in, in getting out a person from prison. And so we, ha and we have a guidelines for our zakat distribution approved, reviewed and approved by a number of Muslim scholars, Mufti Abdurrahman, Sheikh Faraz Arbani, uh, Sheikh Tamim Ahmadi, and I was the one who developed it. And it's actually now used by a couple of other organizations as their zakat distribution me methodology. We, we use it in the traditional uh, method. Uh, and by that I mean we don't use any zakat for our operations. It's all for programs. And that's the traditionally accepted opinion that zakat has to be used for programs directly benefiting uh, the recipients. We also have a program where we're sponsoring students. So it's not to where you would know the individual directly, but your, your donations could be assigned to a specific uh, person, and that would cover their, uh, their, their educational materials. Uh, we also have projects, and one we have displayed over there, that was our, it's our first course that we've developed, a book and an audio commentary CD, and it, was a, it took a long time to get everything, the whole system, from the recording and developing the tracks and working with the sound engineers to printing it, but now we have the system down, and we have a lot of audio material. A lot of audio material has been donated to us by Seekers Guidance, uh, by Zemzem Academy, a number of online academies that have a lot, a wealth of, of audio material, and we just need to get it into the prison. And then we work with the prisons of, each prison has uh, various rules and regulations. Some can receive the CDs directly. Some it has to go through the chaplain. Some can't receive it at all, so we have to give a transcript of the commentary and so forth. Um, so those projects that we have, if you're interested in sponsoring a project, like as a sadaqa jariya, maybe for a, a deceased relative, we're doing that as well, where we take a, a money to, to sponsor a project to get some material to, uh, to, to, to final production, and that would be a sadaqa jariya that we would then distribute to students of knowledge in, in the prison. Right now we have 150 accepted students, and we have a wait list of 75 students. And it's growing. Every week, uh, it's just people are saying, all over the U.S. now, from all over the U.S., men and women, 
uh, they're asking to be part of this. So I took a little bit longer than, than I had originally planned for. I hope staying till 4 rather than 3.30 is not a, much of an inconvenience for everybody. But right now what we'll do is we'll uh, show the, the video and then we'll have a panel discussion to answer questions about uh, that anybody has. Uh, one project that we have right now is that we would like, to, we have, alhamdulillah, we have dedicated people, talented people that, uh, that, uh, that are talented in the audiovisual realm, but we just need some equipment in our, uh, in our office. Right now we're using uh, the, the former Zaytuna, uh, uh, Zaytuna Institute office in Hayward, California. It's part of the collaboration where we're, dealing, we're taking on their prison outreach work and they're allowing us the use of the facility. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we have an office uh, that's not uh, draining, our, draining our budget. Uh, we have the people, we just now need equipment. Everybody's been using their own personal laptops. And I mean, even myself, my laptop crashed last week and I had to get another laptop. So everybody's using their own personal laptops. We would like to get a very solid computer um, and the, to do some of the audio visual work that we need and what was recommended to us by um, uh, people that are v well acquainted with that is to get a Mac, so a Macintosh to, to do that material. And we'd also like to get another desktop for our volunteers when they come in to be able to answer and respond to all of these questions. Uh, we would like a budget of $1,500 to $2,000 for, for those two computers and for other associated things. That would be a sadaqa jariya if you're interested in an ongoing charity. That's, that's something that's going to be very essential to our organization. In the back, we have uh, coin jars that if you'd like to um, uh, take a coin jar and just have it in your home. It doesn't have to be placed in a business. And we record it and then those, the, those donations, we collect them. And we also give you a tax receipt for those. Um, is there anything else? Okay. And the, 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 the coin jars, it's like very, it's, it's good for us and it's good for you. Because for you in your home, it, it gives you the opportunity of doing a sadaqa on a daily basis. Even if it's just a penny. And trust me, those pennies add up. When we, when we, when we run it through the machines to see that, alhamdulillah, the average that those jars bring us is $250 a year. So it's very, it's very good. And you don't even notice it. It's just the change, spare change. And we call the program Make a Change with Change. Um, and you will be making a change with change because all of those those coins and the quarters and the and the uh, we can't uh, right now we have a lot of Chuck E. Cheese money and some other uh, <laughs> world currency. Khalil was tripping; it was uh, interested at all the world currency. We get you know somebody comes back from a trip, they're like, well, it's sadaqa. The world currency we can donate to the we can have uh, converted at the the banks, but the Chuck E. Cheese money we still haven't figured out how to how to deal with that. It's it's there's a value to it, so it's an amana we have to figure out maybe. You guys want to buy some Chuck E. Cheese money? <laughs> so we'll start now with the... Uh I was sentenced to 16 years of life and um, for second degree murder. I started my time about 91. Um, my case, my crime was actually committed in 89, but I was out on bail, this and that, uh, in the county. So my time actually started in February 1991. I had a lifestyle that was, you know, just crazy. So once I went to the hole, um, during that time, it allowed me that break to just read things like that. Cause during the time you're in the hole, you're pretty much in solitary confinement, you know, isolation. So pretty much the only thing you're gonna be doing is either writing letters or uh, reading. So during that time, I started requesting books. I knew I was gonna be doing some reading. So I started asking the guys on the tier, as they call it, you know, uh, where, where we live, uh, you know, you kind of like shouting out of the cell block, you know, asking for books or whatever. And so, um, I ended up with an almanac, a world almanac. And in the world almanac, it had a section on religion. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna just read that. Cause I was in search. I was actually, I went to the hole, I messed up. You know, I said, man, let me try to get myself right. Let me look at some things, right? Reassess some things. Um, so when I started reading the different religions, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, I was reading all these different things. When I got to Islam, 
uh, as I read that whole section, it kind of broke down the pillars. It talked about um, uh, different, uh, the articles of faith and things like that. And it really was attractive. It made sense. It seemed practical. So after I completed reading this, I said, this is it. So I immediately got up and went to my cell door and started yelling out the tear, telling the staff, you know, uh, the, the, the state, you know, workers that I need a Quran. After I got maybe to the first, through the first couple of chapters, uh, halfway through Surah Baqarah, or Surah, the second chapter of the Quran, I knew I was going to be Muslim. Yeah, I just got up and I yelled out the tear because it was a few guys I'd been communicating with on the tear there. I said, from here on out, I'm a Muslim. Just so y'all know, I'm a Muslim. And they was like, okay, whatever, you know. I was um, in a prison in Kalinga. So now, now that I'm here in this hellhole, I'm like at the bottom of the ladder of life. And I need to find something that's going to uplift me, I guess. That's what it was. Allah finally debased me enough to the point to where now you're at the point to where you're going to hear me. When you find something and you feel that it's for real and you try to be serious, you, you do it the best you can. So that's what happened with me. And so I took Shahada, alhamdulillah, 1998. You know, it was a trip. The journey was for me was real good because I had been reading all these books. I had accumulated, you know, I had read the entire uh, volumes of uh, Bukhari. I went through each volume. I was on the quest for knowledge. I just wanted knowledge. So every day I would try to seek out the brothers that I knew that was there, the inmates, the, among the Muslim inmates, and ask them for knowledge. You know, whatever they had, if it was learning the prayer, if it was the Arabic, uh, whatever it was, I was like, you know, give it to me. Give me some books to go back with. A year later, okay. Yusuf showed up on the yard. And then that time, he really introduced us into studying fiqh. He was the one that really said, look, you know, we didn't, there's more to Islam than just, you know, the five pillars. So that's when we started, really started, we set up this learning jamaah and we started to educate each other. You know, I felt like it was important that I teach the Muslims that were there, that would come in contact with, so that when they get out and go to their families and go to their community, you know, they have something to offer. And, or even if it's just themselves being, you know, sound. We wrote to a whole bunch of organizations, a whole bunch of massages all over. And no one would answer us. Then we got a, we did get a letter back from Zaytuna. Actually, I was with Brother Yusuf when we got that letter back and everything. So, you know, alhamdulillah. You know, me and Yusuf sat for many, many, many nights together talking about, man, when we get out, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And, and, but, you know, he had life, and I was getting out. And I actually got out in 2002. So right up to the time that I was leaving, he was just like, Brother, you said, you said, hey, you're the first one from our little Jamaat that's going to get out. Uh, and sorry, I had been telling him before he had got out, before he had paroled, make sure that he goes to Zaytuna. You know, brother, make sure you get down to Zaytuna and, um, and f find the brothers. That's basically what I said. Find the brothers. I, you know. Now, we saw brothers come. We saw brothers come and go. We saw brothers, Muslims, leave us from that prison and say, oh, yeah, brother, when I get out, man, I'm going to put, you know, they knew our dilemma that we didn't have no outside contact with a lot of the misogyny. So we was always, we were seeking this knowledge, man. We was hungry for this knowledge and we couldn't get it from nobody. And so like all these brothers that get out, they were like, yeah, man, I, yeah, I'm going to go to this place and I'm going to hook you guys up. I'm going to have people come back in here and write you and, and, and get you the material that you need. And, and we said, okay. And we, all these empty promises, you know, the brothers got out, nothing ever happened. So Yusuf told me that, look, man, the core out of the core, I was the first one from the core to get out. And he just said, brother, it's up to you now. And I'm like, 
Inshallah, man, I'm not going to let us down, you know. And then I got out. I would have to say that the beginnings of Tayba started um, back in 2002. And it was, I met a brother named Ansari Greenwell. And he was, he was in prison. And he came out and he was studying. He was a group of, of dedicated students within the prison. They didn't have many resources, but whatever they had, whatever Arabic books, books on usul, books on fiqh, books on aqidah, they were studying them and really soaking them up. I said, hey, Rami, you know, there's this brother, man, that I was in prison with named Yusuf, man. Look, he, he's, he's like the alum for us in there. And, I, and what happened was I had this little fake book. This little book that I took notes with, and when I got out and was got to know Rami and everything, and then one day I was studying, I was going through my book, and I was like, "Oh yeah, uh, what's the deal? What's the deal on that shit?" You know, I used to tell Rami, "What's the deal on that?" And and he was like, "What's that book you got?" And I was like, "Oh, these are just some notes." And then he looked, he went through my book, and he was like, "Where did you learn this?" He was amazed. I was like, "Man, we learned that. I learned that in prison." He's like, "What?" He couldn't believe it that we this extensive little book of fic that I had. And he's like, man, you taught it. And I said, yeah, man. I said, I was with, I'm telling you, I'm with this brother named Yusuf. And we learned, we taught each other this. And that's how, then I said, look, you really need to help this brother further his quest for sacred knowledge. So then he comes to tell me there's a brother named Yusuf Wiley uh, who's in prison. He's leading a number of, of halakas and teaching. So based on his questions, I said, this brother needs to, needs, needs to further his studies and, and, have a, and have access to a teacher. So I started teaching Yusuf in 2002 through collect phone calls, um, really uh, that I would pay out of my own. Uh, it wasn't associated with any organization. So we kept that up for a number of years, and we, we studied um, uh, a number of texts. Um, the uh, introduction uh, of introductory fiqh through Ibn Ashir and Akhdari, the purification of the heart, Matarat uh, al-Qulub by Muhammad Mawlud, the prohibitions of the tongue by Muhammad Mawlud, the Ejrumiya in Arabic grammar, um, a number of other texts by Muhammad Mawlud, the, the rights of the parents, um, the, the poem of reflection, the edib of the student by Imam Zarnuji, um, also Mustalah um, al-Hadith uh, al-Bayquniya, the studies in usul, and uh, and all of this and, and 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 along with this, also he's asking questions, and I'm you know responding to the questions, and so it's building up his uh, his his studies, and then he turns around directly and starts teaching other people. And so then we established, we we founded uh, Tayba Foundation in 2008 uh, to as an educational and charitable organization to continue this. By that time, he had gotten the he had got he had studied all of his fard ain to where uh, at mastery level and uh, and even fard kifaya sciences and he was busy in 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 teaching other people also in his rehabilitation programs and then in his own fight to get in his own legal battle to get uh, out of prison when he um, when he went up for the board review and we were wait waiting for the response this was in uh, December I believe it was the 21st, I, I saw some emails and I was looking at some other, uh, uh, some other emails and uh, I had just passed by the email on my phone from the Governor Legal Affairs Office. And then I clicked on it and this is basically going to say like whether we've denied his parole or not, which means another two, three, four, five years and this process has to start again. So I looked at it and it said the Governor has, dis uh, has denied to review the case, which means He's, he's free. But as I'm reading it, I'm saying, am I reading it right? Am I reading it wrong? And so I went over and I, and I looked at it and it said, you know, I, uh, it finally hit me that, okay, he's going to be free. And I went and uh, I, I, I immediately went and I prayed Salat al-Shukr. And when I, I remember clearly having my forehead on the ground, you know, and at that, and it was a, it was a sajda that I've been waiting for for years to be able to, you know, to thank Allah for, for what he, for what he's done for us. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, sir. Hope you love. Hope brother. Yes, sir. Together, brother. We said it was going to happen. Hope you love. 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 Hope how we ride looking at the new cars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How you doing? Yeah, good. How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? Well, he's just not real yet. You know, like I'm still in the dream, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I'm still in the dream. You know? But it's, it's a blessing. Uh, <laughs> 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 you, you ain't changed a bit. Just a little bit more great. Yeah, a little bit more great. That's it. Yeah. 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 21 yeah. years later, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How does it feel I'm walking into like, like just like driving around in the city, driving to Berkeley Bowl with Ansari? Yeah, just it's just yeah. It can't. It's no words for it. It's really no words for it. Yeah, it, it's no words for it. You know what I mean? I think that uh, once I sleep and wake up, make sure I don't wake up inside Avenal State Prison. <laughs> no, you're you know gonna beat you right here, man. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, How does it feel to look like out at a, a big green field and I know, know that you're huh? not in a I know, huh? no no well, grass there's some, period. There's some barber uh, well, barber right there I though. Know, razor that's okay. wire. Grass though. We didn't have you grass. didn't have grass. We didn't have grass. We only had dirt. Wow. So how long has it been since you've seen grass? It's been a while. How about trees? It's been a long, long while. Trees, yeah. I wanted to touch some trees too when I was over in the van when before. Did they let you? No, I, I didn't get a chance to get out. Yeah. That's the red one. They have a smell? Not really, huh? It was off. Yusuf made a, a, a vow. He, he, he made a vow with Allah. He said, uh, he, told, he later told me this, but he made a vow with Allah that uh, he said, Oh, God, if you get me out of prison, release me from prison, I will dedicate myself to serving the community every single day. And he means the community, humanity, not just the Muslim community, but the human community every single day. So since he's been out, it's uh, he's been involved in a number of projects. And with us, he, he dedicates a lot of time helping the Taba Foundation in our distance education course because there's a lot of other Yusufs out there. And there's a lot of other potential. And there's uh, one thing that always amazes me about um, the prisoners, the inmates, is the amount of potential that they have. And, you know, we see uh, whether it's questions of fiqh or understanding of tafsir, uh, Arabic, you know, we get, uh, I, I see their work in Arabic and they're writing in Arabic and they're all doing this in the confines of prison and with extreme limited, uh, uh, extremely limited resources. So what we want to do is replicate the, the model. So where, whereas it uh, previously was myself, one person, teaching one student or two or three students, we want to be able to have a team of teachers teaching hundreds of students. A promise is big in Islam. So if you didn't do something and you didn't rectify, you just let the weeks go by. You know what? I never took my house to the store that day and blah, blah, blah. Did you ever call my and say, you know what? I apologize. I know I promised to take you to the store last week and I didn't even get right there. Yeah, you gotta make for that. You asked about the, the, the letters and can one person handle it. And really when you open a letter from, from, a, from an inmate, it's not really just read the letter, respond to them. Uh, you're, you're opening into the life of a human being. And a life of a human being that really feels forgotten. A lot of the Muslim inmates feel forgotten um, in the Muslim community. They identify themselves as part of the greater ummah, but... They they don't have uh, they don't have a connection to them you know even if they send out mail to organizations those organizations in Masajid if they especially if they don't have a prison outreach uh, program they're not able to to respond so you're getting a person that's been writing for for years and years and not getting a response the Muslims didn't embrace them so they wrote that Masjid in their neighborhood that they was paroling to but that Masjid didn't write them back so going in there now hey y'all didn't get my letter. You know, they not see what I'm saying. There's this dis this this disconnect. Because you can see, we just get stacks and stacks of letters, and each one is going to involve a lot of uh, care and concern. 
because if they don't if they don't get a response then it's as if they feel well just one more time here's another organization we've written and they haven't um, they haven't uh, written back to us so uh, when I uh, when I read the mail every Friday and we set up all of the the mail to be responded to starting on Monday um, so when I'm sitting there at my desk and reading these uh, one time it struck me just reading letter after letter and hearing people saying that they don't have any connect you know there's nobody responding to them and um, I, I asked another brother who, who was in prison, I said, did it ever feel when you were writing organizations that you were like stuck on a desert island, putting a message in a bottle and throwing it out there and just hoping one day that it'll float to somebody and that one day somebody will open it and actually be able to respond? And he said, that's exactly how we felt. So every time I open those letters, it's like opening a message in a bottle and just somebody just with a hope and a desire that just wants to that just wants to learn more about uh, about their faith. This is where my prison outreach started and started getting all the letters. I started getting so many letters. You can see even even with my filing, it just got uh, um, too much for me to handle. And these letters, this is letters from Yusuf going back to 2003. Um, and then Yusuf's letters and correspondence with me became so much that I actually had to have uh, binders just for him. But I wanted to read one letter that, uh, and it just kind of sums up what a lot of people feel because at the end of the day, these are human beings. At the end of every one of these, these files, at the end of every one of these letters is a human being with a heart, with feelings. And um, so this brother writes, he says, Alhamdulillah, the ugliness of this prison and my imprisonment is balanced by my ties of Iman and Islam to you and other mu'minun. The harshness of my existence is softened by Allah's mercy manifesting itself through you and the mu'minun. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. May Allah Ta'ala bless you with new and illuminating insights and guide you in piety and righteousness to success in this life and success in the akhirah. First and foremost, the Muslims have to understand that the brothers inside are generally Muslim. I think that's the biggest I issue for, especially for them inside. They feel like the Muslims in free society don't look at them as Muslims. I think that's the biggest single thing that the Muslims need to know out here is that, you know, they literally believe that the Muslims in free society don't consider them genuine, genuine or bona fide Muslims. Therefore, they don't help them. You want somebody coming back out that's still a thug or a gangbanger or revert back to his old lifestyle hustling and being a difficult neighbor to you or somebody that gets out that's generally, you know, Muslim and that has a lost in their heart and they're connecting with a community that cared about them while they was in there. You see what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to do the work and, you know, uh, like I said from the beginning, the last talk that I gave when I was inside was service, Urbadiyah. And Urbadiya from the standpoint of to Allah, but also to humanity, the rest of humanity, you know, and I think that as long as I stay in that mindset of being of service, that everything else is going to fall into play. We are the answer. We, we're the helper of the people, man. And that's all we want to do, man, is help people. That's all I ever want to do, you know, is do the best I can to help the human being. So I think to support an organization like this would actually for society as a whole, not just the Muslim community, but society at large. A, a number of Muslims in prison, they refer to themselves as the forgotten believers. And so what we want to do is, is, to, is to bridge the gap between our Muslim brothers in, in prison and the community that does have concern for them if they knew about their situation. But in a lot of situations, they just don't know. And so we just want to remind them and remind them to remember their forgotten Muslim brothers and sisters in prison.